<laughs> I'm not speaking on behalf of Seychelles here. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So. Oh, I think we have to run. No, let's have to. Is that your little coffee? Your cafe. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you check whether the red light is uh, on so that we have it recorded? It would be a pity. You know? The red light is on. Okay. It should be flashing. No, no. It's on. It's on, then we are. Yeah, I think I see. I think we should leave this part in at the beginning of the video. Yes. Uh, we will. Red light's Which on. Part? Are you, are you <laughs> recording? Part? It's, the numbers are going, so we're good. Okay, the, the numbers are going, that's good. Yes. So, welcome everybody. My name is Miroslav, I'm from Austria, from the International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Changes. We are here at the UNFCCC Spring Conference in Bonn, and uh, we have here this mini side event uh, to present the Give Youth a Chance initiative, a call for resources for youth climate action. And I will start uh, with a video uh, from an event uh, in Marrakesh in November last year where we have started this uh, initiative. And then we will talk with Tim about uh, the state of the art and uh, the plans for the future so, and progress made so far. So, this is Nadia and she is explaining what it is about at the flash mob at COP23. Yes, so, um, you and me, we're here today at the COP22. We, the youth, are here because we want to change the world. We want to change our future. So actually, we have to change the future as it is now bound for us to be. They're saying the future lies in our hands. But, so we're here now. We are ready. We are many. We're full of visions and we're ready to act. But what we need are resources. We need resources of the generations who went the path ahead of us. <laughs> That's why we, IAAI, launched an initiative in cooperation with younger and um, young uh, youth organizations such as Climates, um, where we write the letter to the powerful and rich of the world Timothy Damon, uh, founder and director of the Global Youth Development Institute, has been the focal point for the youth constituency and uh, without beard at the time. <laughs> and uh, uh, we are delighted to partner with you and your organization. And uh, could you tell us, uh, give some more insights regarding this uh, issue, uh, this challenge of getting resources to young people so that they can be, play an active role in these efforts for um, halting climate change and ad adapting to it. Yes, thank you very much, Miro, and thank you everyone for being here with us. There's a lot of competing events right now here in Bonn. So as we were calling for in this video to give youth a chance, uh, there's a lot of resources that young people are lacking to fully engage the potential they have for climate action. You know, the most obvious of these is financial resources, that it's very expensive to engage in these conferences or to fund projects, to fund startups like the Global Youth Development Institute, but it's also institutional resources and technical resources. For example, there's a lot of really great energy when the young people come together here at these meetings and the big conference of parties that happens in November, where we'll be in Bonn again, but these ideas then don't have a home 
when the youth spread back to their home countries, their home NGOs, which is a reason also I've created Global Youth Development Institute is to try to create an institution to preserve these many ideas that are brought up, but again, it comes then back to financial resources to be able to support a structure, an institution, and then also the technical aspects of things, and we could get into climate change education and the need for more young people outside of the climate bubble to know what is going on and to become engaged. But we do have many young people in this process who are perfectly poised to do that in terms of peer-to-peer -peer trainings, because we do that every year for the Conference of Youth, and there will be a Conference of Youth here in Bonn, and lots of peer-to-peer -peer education going on. But there's many examples we can talk about here today in terms of how to take all of the, the potential that's here and, again, give you the chance to fully escalate those activities to really deliver on the momentous change that we need if we're going to preserve ourselves from climate change and transition to a just and sustainable world. Thank you very much, Tim. So, uh, I would like to uh, explain a little bit the rationale behind the uh, Give Youth a Chance call for resources for youth climate action and the partnership, the multi stakeholder partnership, Glotcha, which uh, has been put together to, to fix this uh, challenge and to provide a, really a systemic solution to this resource mobilization challenge. So, we are here at the UNFCCC meeting, that's really the place where uh, the whole global community comes together to solve this climate crisis, which is the biggest crisis that the world is facing. And uh, they are doing this since 25 years. And still the emissions are going up, 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 and uh, the pro they didn't fix the problem. And uh, in Paris in 2015 at COP21, uh, the Conference of the Parties, there uh, was a real paradigm shift where the governments have uh, uh, admitted that they cannot do it alone and that they have given a more prominent role to non-state actors. And also the uh, COP22 in Marrakesh, the big annual conference on climate change last year, uh, further strengthened this message and one of the most important outcomes of the Marrakesh uh, conference has been the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, which again calls uh, these uh, non-state actors to take action and to contribute because that's the only way how we will really be able to, uh, to manage this challenge. And a very important group of uh, people, uh, of our population, which can really drive this uh, deep transformation, deep societal transformation to a low carbon society, are young people. And, uh, but we have the problem that uh, these young people, although they are enthusiastic, they know it's about their future, they want to take action, they are limited, and uh, it is the limitations are in national governments. They don't have uh, budget reserves to give, and we have seen here now that uh, from the small island development states, from Fiji, and so there are almost no youth representative. Although it would be so inspirational and important and really transformational to have them here, but nobody has the resources, and. Uh, I have also here a video from one of our partners, from the Glotcha partnership, this multi-stakeholder partnership, uh, John Crawley of, from the UNESCO Management of Social Transformation Program, and he will uh, explain and uh, uh, further strengthen his commitment to our joint work that we build a multi-stakeholder partnership of youth organizations, of civil society organizations, social entrepreneurs, wealth holders, United Nations agencies, and also public authorities on national and local level, that we build a, a global challenges action network and that we build the information systems uh, that we can give value to the youth climate action and then develop new uh, incentive mechanisms uh, that will uh, then reach uh, the young people and their uh, activities uh, in a setting of uh, uh, micro social entrepreneurship. So, uh, this uh, partnership, Glotcha, uh, is uh, something that we have set up. Uh, 
that uh, through uh, Global Challenges Foundation New York, which is a 501c3 organization, it has tax exempt status, and all the different partners are somehow co-owners. We mobilize resources in a global commons setting. We say that. Uh, uh, everything that we are bringing together and the uh, information and communication technology infrastructure that we are building belongs to the whole world and even to future generations. And uh, the idea, uh, the call for resources, uh, it uh, was with the idea that there is a lot of wealth in the world. For instance, these 1,500 billionaires that are, uh, according to Forbes list, there. Uh, having such a wealth accumulation and on the other uh, hand this important process here not being able to bring a few uh, young people from the small island development states here that's a systems failure yeah. and uh, many of these resource holders have already uh, acknowledged this and uh, we have here with us Christina Stevens who is a friend of Ted Turner he was uh, a pioneer in global philanthropy, given away one billion dollars of his wealth to support the United Nations. And uh, also uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, they have followed uh, this uh, example and they have called on 150 billionaires' families and they have pledged to give back to society half of their wealth. So there's already about 400 billion dollars in the air, so to say, ready to be channeled to uh, uh, public good generation. And we are uh, now trying to establish the link between the work of young people in these processes and these uh, global philanthropy resources. And uh, yeah, would you like to comment uh, a little bit on this, or shall I show first uh, the video of John Crawley, uh, how he sees the link between his work uh, in a UN organization and our efforts with Glotcha? Just to yeah, very quickly build on that. Absolutely, there are no SIDS youth with us here, and we're equally concerned that they will not have the resources to be with us in November. And it's not only SIDS youth, but young people from throughout the Global South are not very well represented in the UN process, and especially at, at the small meetings uh, that we're at currently. So it makes it very difficult then for the young people to live up to our core values of inclusivity and participation, accountability, being fair representatives of young people because we're missing the most crucial voices. And while I certainly take as many opportunities as I can to stress the absence of those voices here, uh, we need those voices here themselves. None of us can can make up for them not being here. And so, as you said, it's a systems failure that, like, there's no excuse. Like, we could correct this, and we're going to correct this. We are going <laughs> to correct this, no doubt. So let's uh, hear our partner from UNESCO, who was also with us already at uh, COP21, uh, and uh, then in Marrakesh, and committed to help us build the knowledge base and the uh, that we really build our work on a landed mandate from a UN organization. But we are partnering also with other UN bodies. Good morning to everyone. Nice to uh, talk to you, even if I can't be with you in Bonn, and even if I can't be uh, engaging in conversation with you, it's still a great pleasure for me to participate virtually in this event and to reiterate, if I've done it on previous occasions, in other COP meetings, sitting alongside uh, my friend Noor Polsa, to reiterate UNESCO's commitment to finding new ways, not just of understanding climate change as a comprehensive social challenge, but mobilizing very diverse groups of actors in order to respond to the challenges of climate change. Um, the mistake, which I don't think anyone makes anymore, is to think that climate change is primarily a regulatory and a technical challenge as if getting the right um, policies and getting the right technologies would be enough to address the issue. I think it's well recognized now that alongside those important issues, there are much more profound questions of uh, social transformation that need to be addressed. And to address them, we need spaces of dialogue, engaging young people with what is their future, engaging people who are not necessarily uh, comfortable with rapid change, in order to find ways of making that change work for everyone, not just for a few, as the uh, UN uh, I know 
the sultan has it, leaving no one behind. And of course, leveraging not just the energies of individuals, but new ways of getting individuals working together, so as to create new dynamics. Because clearly, old ways of working, old institutions, old social practices are not necessarily the ones we need in order to address the challenges of today and of tomorrow. So we will continue to partner with Mirror's initiatives, uh, with the UNSCCC Secretariat, with our other partners in the UN system, to find ways, very practical ways, of getting those energies synergizing so as to create the conditions where not just top down from the UNFCCC process, but also bottom up from the heart of every society, action against climate change can become part of normal, routine, everyday life. And not something added on top of and largely separate from the way people live their lives. I look forward very much to hearing uh, the outcome questions, and I hope I have the opportunity to participate in person in one future events of this uh, very ambitious and very exciting activity. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, John Crawley. So, um, it's uh, really one of our main partners, uh, the UNESCO Management of Social Transformation Programs. But we have also the UN Women program as a partner. We've had uh, early March uh, uh, workshop at the premises of UN Women in New York, where we've uh, prepared input uh, to the youth forum of UN Women. Uh, and uh, the topic was young uh, women and men challenging inequality in the face of climate change. And uh, we I'm working also with UNIDO, with the Productive Work for Youth Unit, and we've been with them at the ECOSOC Youth Forum in New York end of uh, January this year, and we've had a workshop uh, in uh, Vienna at the United Nations on the 16th of January. The topic was Youth Engagement in Agenda 2030 through Social Entrepreneurship and Digital Social Currencies, because the challenge is even if we would have uh, big resources, who will then decide uh, who receives the money? It's not uh, one big topic is UN participation in the process, uh, youth participation in the process, but uh, even more important is the local action, the everyday action young people can take in support of the SDGs, and uh, we need information systems that are somehow identifying those activities with the highest impact in terms of SDGs and really delivering certified SDGs uh, units uh, that will then uh, be the basis for connecting young people with uh, the resources from different uh, blended financing from different sources. And uh, this is our work on the Agenda 2030 marketplace, which is an integral part of the Give Youth a Chance uh, campaign. We are working with UN Habitat, with the Youth and Urban Economy branch there. Uh, and they said they will uh, be happy to sign with us a memorandum of understanding and set up with us a Global Challenges Youth Centers. The idea is that young people need an entry point, a local level entry point, where they can receive capacity, where they receive access to internet in developing countries, or where, uh, access to technology and access to finance. And the idea is that in the long run, with support uh, of uh, UN organizations like UN Habitat, uh, there should be such a Global Challenges Youth and ICT Center in every city and every local community. And another initiative that we are uh, working on in this context of Give Youth a Chance is the Global Challenges Youth Music Contest because uh, we need to reach the young people, we need to activate them, they are thinking. And there's a saying that um, uh, the mind uh, takes uh, up only things for which the heart has opened. And uh, so with music you can uh, build bridges between the hearts and the minds of the people. And uh, this is a very important element. And uh, on the plan for today's mini side event, there has been also uh, a contribution from Marcio Chitini from UNITA. It's the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Uh, they are thinking, they are managing also the climate change learning platform and uh, capacity building for green economy and uh, we are planning to work together as well but there have been some technical issues 
So this is a little bit of an update. I have perhaps uh, an important update also. On our social media, you will see uh, videos from our workshops in uh, New York and uh, also the press conference in Marrakesh. And in the workshop in New York, we have seen, uh, well, somehow made an upgrade in our strategy because the initial idea was that youth leaders and UN system representatives and IAI, we uh, write a letter to the signatories of the Giving Pledge and uh, tell them about what we are doing, that this is really a critical infrastructure, a new partnership, a new governance model. Uh, for multi-stakeholder engagement, non-state actors engagement in Paris Agreement implementation and Agenda 2030, and that they would then uh, send us the money. But uh, it's not that easy. Uh, we've had uh, one uh, a grandson of one of the uh, global philanthropy leaders uh, mentioned before with us who said he would be ready to be our spokesperson, but somehow it's not that easy. And so in, uh, at the UN Women Workshop we said we have to have a parallel communication channel as well, so that we will uh, write uh, open letters to the uh, wealth holders of the world. So not targeting only the Giving Pledge, but having this, them as an example, and having really big editorials, big open letters in the New York Times, in the Figaro, uh, Pravda, I don't know what is now in Russia, the, the, uh, the most important uh, newspaper, so, so that we really raise public awareness uh, about these topics and that uh, we uh, create a social campaign where people can uh, endorse it and then they can also somehow say what they are doing for the climate or whether they are ready to contribute any financial resources through this crowdfunding platform that we have on razoo.com. And so these are the ideas. We will also try to get the climate champions, uh, who are the leaders of the process here for non-state actors engagement in Paris Agreement in relation to getting them behind our efforts because it's also for their benefit that we uh, we do this work and we uh, mobilize resources on a large scale which will then systemically function in empowering especially youth but also other non-state actors. And uh, this uh, context also one element that is uh, for how we would use the resources is to build the information infrastructure uh, and some kind of data portal and data partnership with the NASCA portal of UNFCCC because uh, the Paris Agreement uh, calls on non-state actors to take action and to document what uh, non-state actors are doing on the portal of the non-state actors zone for climate action, NASCA. And for this, uh, uh, for handling this data, there are data partnerships and our partnership here, the Glotcha partnership, will uh, work on uh, developing the information system that will document and uh, give value to non-state actors' uh, climate action, especially in the fields of education, communication and outreach. And for this we have on Wednesday in the evening a side event, an official side event uh, to, for the topic of blockchain. Uh, how can blockchain technology help to implement the Paris Agreement? So it's, we have the music thing, we have the local level centers, we have the Agenda 2030 marketplace as the, uh, the place uh, for blended financing and giving value to youth, and uh, we have this information management also with NASCA and, did I say Global Youth Music Contest already? Yeah, it's about. Everybody has to, uh, a role to play, that's a mantra we hear here at almost every presentation and uh, we need uh, also systemic solutions and we are here to provide them with partners like Tim. Do you have any comments? And then we uh, open up for comments. Yeah, my thank you, Miro, for that really comprehensive overview of all these different interlinked initiatives because it, it's really, I think, a strong ecosystem of actions which are taking place. The one comment I would add right now would be that, yes, we're asking for resources for young people, and I know that that's a pretty common, there's many demands from young people uh, for inclusion and such, but these are tied to concrete projects. So there's actually something we can go, and if we had money tomorrow from this, you know, 
we could be implementing. So for example, GYDI would be helping to create a training program to bring young people from the SIDS and other Global South countries to be able to meaningfully engage in this process alongside the rest of the young people who are coming here. And like there have been attempts in the past to bring young people and you know just giving money to get them here, but it's not enough to get you here. You need to be able to meaningfully engage, which means yeah. capacity mm -hmm. building and education. And then of course those young people go back home and having been trained and empowered in this setting, they are then the, the trainers and empowerers back at home. And along with that, there's a second project. I had the honor to be part of a workshop for young people from the SIDS and Commonwealth countries, which was hosted in Mauritius last fall, before the COP. And I was there only as a trainer, but I realized they have a very effective model. Why couldn't we replicate this training of trainers model for other regions outside of the SIDS countries? And this is another project that we could implement very easily. And again, it's a big ecosystem. You know, I'm, I'm researching and I know there are other similar kinds of initiatives, but none of them have touched the work that the young people are directly doing through this process. So there is definitely still a gap in the ecosystem, and I see strategic partnerships with Wocha and the Global Island Partnership and other initiatives as ways to connect the dots and fill in this, this gap. Yeah, and perhaps, thank you very much, Tim, and perhaps another example, uh, a concrete example, what uh, how money could be used. We've been yesterday at the presentation of the CORE 13, and really enthusiastic uh, and really smart and everything, young people. And they said, uh, see it also that uh, Global South participation is a challenge they need to address. And they said they want to have uh, 50 uh, young people from the Global South and they propose, propose a, a scholarship of 5,000 euros per person. So these are uh, 250,000 euros that are needed. And, but when asked how they are planning to uh, raise this, they couldn't answer, <laughs> and uh, but we are now, uh, and these young people are very often starting anew. They are not uh, many of them. Uh, for the core organizers, are usually not uh, in the system and experienced with the process and global cooperation and global resource mobilization. So a structure, a global partnership that is uh, sustainable, that is here to stay uh, and to support uh, the, the youth activists as they come and live. Uh, this is something that would really help uh, a lot these efforts of youth, young people to contribute meaningfully and re in a rewarding way. Would you like to add something, Christina? Well, I was just... Would uh, you like to say, come and say it uh, here on the microphone so that you will be also documented? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please join us. Well, I don't really have anything to say. I was just going to ask you a okay. question. The question is always a question. Yes, because, um, you know, if someone, if you want someone to give you some money, I mean, you said, well, we do have concrete projects. Do you have budgets around these? Because, I mean, if someone just walked in here right now and said, I really like what you're saying, um, pulled out their checkbook, can you show them? I mean, do you have your website? Do you have budgets on your website? Do you have very specific numbers to to apply to these projects? This bringing bringing the youth over. I mean, from the smaller islands. I mean, that's a that's a very important thing that we don't have. It's an element that's really crying out for to be fulfilled. Yes. So. GYDI's website is still under construction, but okay. the substantive background work of crafting a budget for this fellowship program, that's the working name, is that this would be some kind of a global youth leadership fellowship for the UNFCCC, uh, the bringing of these young people. That I do have a budget. Uh, it, it would work out to about $10,000 per young person because that's not just, again, the money to bring them here, which the Koi figured that they were using the 5,000. That's enough to get someone here, feed them, and give them a, a roof. But that doesn't include any capacity building. And we've seen in the past, we had money for COP21 to bring about 15, 20 young people from the Global South that didn't include capacity building. And we ran into some problems with that. So that's why 
the budget includes also being able to have a platform for hosting webinars. That's going to cost you a little bit of money. That's in the budget. Uh, it's going to cost you. You want quality trainers. You want quality webinars. You, you need to be able to pay for that, besides the fact that people deserve to be paid <laughs> for their work anyway. Right. Um, because again, all of us here, including myself, we're volunteers. Uh, and as much as you have great intentions as volunteers, you need to eat, you need to pay your bills, and you also deserve some, some dignity of, of having a wage. So that is included, but that's, there is a draft budget right now that if someone walks in, I'm happy to sit down, share with them, explain it, and you know, it's based off of past COPs and researching accommodation prices and bonds. So right. the, the short answer to your question is absolutely yes, uh, there's a draft budget for that. And if someone wanted to replicate the workshop that I mentioned from Mauritius, then all I have to do is get on the phone to my friends in Mauritius and borrow their budget and you know very quickly I could have you the, the updated one for bond and also collaborate that with the Koi budget that they've already been working on supporting the Koi budget from from Youngo because it's it's German NGOs which are taking the lead on that for obvious reasons and yes. each each year it's it's organizations in the host country which do that, but they work in close coordination with the international youth through Youngo, this youth NGO's constituency in the process. So, yes. <laughs> Very good. And Miro, do you? Yes, I yes. also have initiatives uh, with a price tag. Uh, uh, the most important uh, initiative and most concrete one is the Global Challenges Youth Music Contest. Uh, we. Uh, have pre-launched it two days ago and uh, there to have really the online competition and the globally broadcasted TV show we would need about 100,000 euros. If we don't get them we will improvise and we will do something as we've done in Paris uh, having it in the green zone in the UNESCO pavilion but uh, in order to have transformational impact, uh, we would need about 100,000 so that we really produce a high quality edutainment show, which is then taken up by different TV stations around the world and reaches millions of people. Then you can also live stream it, right? Yes, exactly. And be able to, yeah. because you know, a lot of people are only on their phone now, they don't watch a lot of TV. Exactly, yes, that's uh, yes. sure a yeah. very valid point. And uh, the other thing is um, the information systems for the NASCA portal, for non-state actors uh, engagement based on blockchain technology. We have here very interesting conversations uh, with the Sustainable Development Mechanism Unit at UNFCCC. We are going to continue this on Tuesday and uh, this will have uh, again a, a concrete uh, price tag, but this will be much higher, it will be billion plus because uh, it uh, is uh, somehow really the global architecture and the backbone, the informational technological backbone for uh, non actors, uh, the climate action documentation and incentivization, and uh, that would be really a very uh, high impact, uh, social impact uh, investment opportunity. And uh, then is the... Uh, global challenges used at ICT centers, uh, where we have uh, several places and players uh, ready to partner with us. One is on the Greek island of Lesbos. We will have a conference about this end of August. There, with an investment already of 10, 20,000 euros, we could really demonstrate the low-hanging fruits of this uh, uh, systemic uh, approach and uh, globally coordinated uh, empowerment of youth for Agenda 2030 action and climate action. So these are the three uh, elements that I would say is from our side, but uh, then the, uh, what we are working on with UNIDO, this Agenda 2030 marketplace, which mm -hmm. will give to young people when they are doing something on the local level, certified SDGs impact, really like carbon credits, it would be really uh, certified, uh, well-documented, uh, really methodologically correct, um, uh, evaluated uh, uh, impact of these youth activities. This will then uh, make it possible to connect them with money from global philanthropic, global public, uh, market near uh, mechanisms. And that's where the big money should then go to.
It should be an automatic system which would then directly channel money from uh, a foundation or so, which has the aim to support SDG 13 or whatever, and uh, uh, that the money from that foundation would directly flow to the young people who have a certified impact with their uh, activities. So that's the direct link. You don't need then the big program administration units and it will be uh, very efficient and uh, develop, uh, providing a lot of added value for the world in terms of Agenda 2030 implementation and Paris Agreement implementation. And so that uh, people like the Giving Pledge people, it's very difficult, uh, they might be good in earning the money, but it's also uh, a different set of skills and knowledge needed to distribute the money really to the right courses. Right. And such an Agenda 2030 marketplace uh, shall help them. And then, then the, the billionaire could say, okay, I'm interested in this topic, in this region, in this age group or whatever. And uh, the system, the marketplace will connect them with all these youth activities in this rele relevant field which have certified impact. Well, but you know, of course, these people that have all this money, uh, you first have to, as you said earlier, you've got to open their heart. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, you know, do you, I mean, I, I'm sure you, you have the stories that could do that. Um, uh, are you putting these out anywhere? Uh, the, these With the Global Challenges Youth Music Contest and the TV show. Oh, okay. We will try to reach them, reach people the high potential, wealth people, but also the small donations, because uh, it's also one of the uh, uh, potentials for the future uh, uh, for resource mobilization is also individual carbon offset, voluntary carbon offset by global citizens. And uh, the, the UNFCCC has started already with this. They have uh, My Climate Pledge or Climate Pledge, and uh, they partnered with Finland. But they've got only a few hundred of people doing this. Somehow it's not attractive to throw money in a system where you don't know exactly where no, it's, it's going. No, it's not at all. No. <laughs> no. But if we build the information system where uh, those who want to offset their carbon footprint see the projects of the, uh, on the ground of young people, and they can directly say, I want my money to this person, uh, to this uh, youth climate activist, and uh, there can be some kind of new type of community be established and a uh, new quality of uh, climate finance, peer-to-peer -peer climate finance and uh, part of the uh, funding could even go in co-ownership so that if on a local level in the global south or wherever a young person would propose a renewable energy solution uh, which is also infrastructure, it is equity, that uh, somebody uh, being inclined to offset uh, his or her carbon footprint could give the money, but uh, more in an equity type, not as a grant, but uh, as a co-investment in this uh, entrepreneurial activity of a young person. So, new type of thinking uh, that will be resonate more with those who have resources and uh, those who have a sense of global social responsibility. If I may just quickly add on that, there is some effort. There's also the UNFCCC's Global Youth Video Competition. Uh, Youngo, as I mentioned, has, has also done uh, some various sharing, you know, to, to elevate the voices that can't be here in the process and, and give them ways of being included. So, but it, it's been done very ad hoc because we've got a little bit of a catch-22 here. That again, we're all volunteers, yes. and so even having the initial capacity to do a good job of creating the kind of heart-reaching story communication it is difficult. So that would be an area where if someone with good skills in that area would like to partner with us, or if there's someone who would, you know, a, a more like social entrepreneur who could see it as an investment, uh, an impact investment to give us some seed money to do the storytelling component, then that would let us build up this campaign to, to elevate these voices because with our current resources, it's, it's a very much of a struggle to do it, unfortunately. Mm. unfortunately. And elevating these voices. Do you, do you have anything built in to measure the impact that, that, that like the reward that can be seen on the other side of this? Any, is that built into your, that's built into your projects? 
It's built in with the Agenda 2030 marketplace concept. Oh, okay. Really, Very good. Uh, impact is the certified SDGs. Impact is uh, this, uh, what will be the outcome, and, uh, which will be the giving side uh, or the supply side on the market, and then this needs to be connected with public and uh, philanthropic or other market near sources of funding, which are public, good, uh, on local and global level impact oriented. Well, that's great. Uh, terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Where should I send the check? <laughs> <laughs> okay. To the uh, Global Changes Foundation New York, okay. with, uh, because this is the joint resource mobilization and program implementation arm of the partnership, which is co-owned by everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Your, your address and, is uh, Joe, would you like to add something? Uh, you are our partner for the Citizens Climate Engagement Network and how will we uh, equip this uh, network with resources? Uh, should I... Please come join us so that you are on the video. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you both for what you're doing. I think this is so incredibly important to find not just the idea that we can empower people, but actually means of doing it, and specifically the commitment to sustain that support. Yes. Um, so, you know, a couple of years ago in the run-up to the Paris conference, we launched the Halfway to Paris as a way to bring people together and engage their voices in global policy. And then we transitioned the Pathway to Paris project into the Citizens Climate Engagement Network. And what that really is, is a commitment from a coalition of partners to ensure that we sustain means of engaging stakeholders, local community leaders, um, people from different sectors in a global conversation as a way of expanding the civic space so that people can participate in the design of a better climate future. And then attached to that is something we call the Access to Good platform, which is essentially a resource library where people can come together, add comments and information, enhance digital documents, and actually convene meetings inside of those documents. And so, of course, in a space like this, where we're here together to um, essentially redesign the future of policy, those very places where that's happening can become an enhanced convening space. And so one of the things that we really want to do is continue to have youth engagement, continue to provide the Citizens Climate Lobby and Citizens Climate Engagement Network training for people to become local leaders um, so that they basically begin to recognize that they are already stakeholders, they are already people with a voice, and all they need to do is begin uh, setting it in motion. And so um, in those different ways, we're supporting um, engagement and education and capacity building, and certainly we're supporting the Glocha mission and the Global Youth uh, Development Institute and its aim to make sure that empowered youth are able to bring their ideas directly to the table. Thank you very much, Joe. Mm. Sure. Very good. So, if there are no further questions, then we would conclude. And thank you for thank being you. with us, and I hope to have you with us on the journey to a better future. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Another milestone. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> what were they doing down here? Were they vacuuming or something or moving? It sounds like we're moving carts. Oh, okay. Well, all right. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say hi. You have a card? I do, yes. And it's my my new Google oh, developer. You have a new card? Yes. Okay, good. That's our logo. Okay. Did you give right. did you give your information, Tim, uh, on on here of contact information? I know Miro did, but did you? Um I don't believe so, no. Oh. Well oh, this is still recording. This still, it, there you go, jump up. It's still recording. He can cut it in or something. <laughs> oh, if you jumped um, up there, you could actually give your say, information. Yeah. What, just so, so just like can cut it in. The, the email address? Yeah, if someone wants to contact you, if someone sees this video and says, oh, SIDS, I got, uh, I want to bring some SIDS kids in, and this man would be the one that would know.
And certainly for those who would like to reach me, uh, you can do so at timothy.damon at globalyouthdev.org. Think of globalyouthdevelopment.org. Yeah. Great. Thank you.